Brilliant. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello. I'm just going to share my screen um, and present. So my presentation today um, is more of an explorative one, really, and to, to gain some insights into some current research that I'm undertaking into digital competence and confidence of higher educators. And a dimension of that which I've been particularly perplexed by is this notion of cognitive load in an online environment. Um, and I've not really come across extensive research in this area that looks at the impact on students in terms of our instructional design of cognitive load and incorporating that into design of learning materials and delivery as well online. So I'm going to start by saying that we've been online for about two hours now. Is that right, Phil? It is two hours, yes. I think so. So I, I, I think my presentation comes at a very poignant um, point uh, of the today's presentations. Um, how is our cognitive load? How are we managing today? Um, and if we if we take what uh, what Phil's done as an example, these kind of short, sharp bursts of activity, uh, 10 minutes seems pretty short, but um, it's really good in terms of capturing that cognitive load, that working memory. Um, how much of that information have we actually retained? Um, it's very interesting, isn't it, when we're online for so many hours of the day now, given that previous research, pre-pandemic, focused so much on our screen time. And we seem to be spending far more of our time every day on online screens. So have you experienced cognitive overload in an online environment? Perhaps you're experiencing it today. Have you asked your students if they've experienced this online? How would you notice and how would you know? Now, as educators, we can pick up on um, disengagement. Uh, we can pick up on aspects such as lack of response or perhaps even an impact on attainment, which might signify a bit of a cognitive overload. Um, how many of us have actually explored this with our students and, and what do we understand by cognitive overload in an online environment? So as posed by Sweller back in 88, 1988, talked about three dimensions of cognitive load, the extraneous, the intrinsic and germane. I'm not going to talk about those in detail, but I think it's important to note the element of cognitive load, the elements of cognitive load that we can exert control over. And those are the extraneous and the germane um, aspects the intrinsic cognitive load is imposed by the task at hand and sometimes we're limited in terms of the content and the delivery of the content itself but we can influence the manner in which we deliver that information how we design that information and how we support our students to construct those schemas and to encourage that engagement so Again, many of us are already aware of Sweller's cognitive load theory that talks about that limited capacity of working memory. Um, and we know that to maximise learning, our instruction methods really should try and work on not overloading that, that cognitive um, element of, of working memory. So I'd like us to really think about this in terms of the assumptions that we make about cognitive load in online environments. Um, there are quite a few assumptions that we make in terms of being in a digital society now of digital natives um, that we can actually cope with the amount of online stimulation, multitasking that we do experience. Um, and I think that's just a, a, a question really that I'd pose to everybody online is to really think about that. Um, does it have to be a meeting? Does it have to be an online session? Are there alternative ways that we can deliver that information? Um, these are things that I, I definitely think that we should consider as we move forward post pandemic, because there are some things that were necessitated during the pandemic that we've probably not learned um, to kind of uh, move on from and move forward from. So this is a really um, interesting book from Richard Mayer that some of you may be familiar with. And Mayer talks about his 
guiding principles for using multimedia for online learning. And many of these principles are used by instructional designers and also by many academics in higher education. So we do a lot of segmenting and chunking. We make use of our voice and we think about our tone and inflection. Um, we try and avoid redundancy. So, you know, adding multiple um, you know, elements to mean the same thing, for example. And if we think about our digitally native generation of students, there's a particular paper, an article by Sklomowski and Sue that actually counteract Mayer's ideas about extraneous load and reducing extraneous load. And they actually argue that today, the students can actually cope with multiple elements of extraneous load and still be engaged and still learn and still be motivated. But what the researchers do talk about is this alignment of content with assessment. And many of us have heard of a constructive design and, and constructive alignment. But these researchers talk about uh, cognitive load alignment, which particularly interested me um, in terms of directing some of my new research into social media and cognitive overload and how this might impact learning. So again, uh, social media is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's at hand. How is this impacting our student outcomes and, and performances? These are these are the questions that I'm, I'm really posing really in an exploratory manner today. So during the pandemic, many higher education institutions developed a set of principles, guiding principles when it comes to their online learning environments. I've just taken a screenshot here of Canvas, which is one example of an online learning environment. There are many. You may use Blackboard, you may use Moodle. Um, and something that I found particularly useful to balance that cognitive load is to attach timing to particular elements of online learning activity, whether it was synchronous or asynchronous, and using that consistent structure uh, within our online learning materials as well. Fonts and colour have uh, implications for accessibility uh, and instructional design, which uh, many of us are already aware of, um, but we still use a lot of white backgrounds with black text. So it's really interesting that, I think, um, and also, the elements of minimizing that text so we know uh, uh, you know in terms of minimizing that uh, cognitive load of actual text on a page um, we can use elements of such as dual coding on our online learning materials as well and just some more examples here of streamlining content so just really a, a visual again i've posed a question whose role is it anyway so is it our role as educators increasingly is becoming um, a, a, a lecturer's role um, in terms of influencing that online um, instruction? Um, or is it down to an instructional designer at your higher education institution? Or perhaps it's a combination of both, which is really going to achieve the best outcomes for our students. So we know that multimedia video and interactive simulations can really enhance that engagement, but I think we've got to use them spare, sparingly. Um, and by using them, we've got to use the associated pedagogy in, in the best manner as well, particularly when it comes to online videos and lectures, when they don't have any scaffolding, when there is limited student-teacher interaction, the students might actually struggle to comprehend that content, and they're not used to watching um, such lengthy videos, for example, but how long is too long? So another question that I'm posing as well in terms of online learning materials that are pre-recorded. Students are very much used to um, reels on Instagram, for example, these short bursts of learning. That's it in terms of my presentation. I really did just want to pose a couple of questions there. Um, and I can Amazing. see some Thank interesting so things much. in the chat. Thank you. There are so many. Uh, the chat is going crazy, which is really, really great. I think you had some real top tips there. And I love the 
the one near the start really when you were saying about you know how do you know if your students are being overloaded just just ask them actually just speak to them everyone you know we're all in this together um but be prepared that you may get the answer that you may not wish or like but you know it's i think that's the important thing is that you have to have those open and frank conversations with people um so we do have um a couple of minutes so if you do have a question if you'd like to raise your hand if not i can just have a look in the q a and see if there are any in there mm -hmm. um paul has his hand up paul are you able to unmute yourself from previously yes i think so great thank it's a you. great presentation it falls on to something like being banging the drum about in my university which is aston in birmingham but trying to get colleagues to think about the way they present materials and to use the different colors and fonts that go into multimedia design and learning. So we should definitely have a chat at some point together because I'd like to do some more research on this. But it's frustrating that quite often one of the things was about using white backgrounds. Quite often there's a mismatch, a mismatch between what the university presents us as corporate slides to use versus what's good design for teaching and pedagogy and getting students on board. And this is one of my frustrations and that these things don't often line up. I didn't know whether you've had any experience of that yourself then. Uh, yeah, definitely, Paul. So, um, you know, there's a set of guiding principles that are expected to be used as a standard uniformly across all disciplines, colleges and schools. And that doesn't work for everyone, certainly doesn't work for our neurodivergent students. We know that uh, in terms of design and accessibility. But I think, you know, there's a bigger picture here for us to think about, which is um, how ready we really are for generation Gen Alpha who really are scrolling to, through things so fast. And one of the other colleagues um, online today talked about how our students are the experts. Our students are more uh, adept at digital platforms than we are. So, you know, we should really draw on some of their experience and their expertise. And I don't think we're doing enough of that. Um, and I do think that some of our modes of delivery, uh, without trying to bash any of these online learning platforms, are a little bit archaic. Um, and then they're not really up to par with what our students are doing on other platforms like TikTok, like Instagram, you know, like Snapchat, etc. And all these other social media platforms that are coming in. I think one of the things I've, I've been frustrated by is in higher education compared to other forms of education, the lack of differentiation that we mm. we are told to have. There isn't much mention of that. But also all the things like the HEA and the different things we are supposed to do as a qualification framework. None of these are about developing some of these skills and knowledge to be able to help students, really. Yeah. So my doctor at the moment is on the professional development of academic staff. So all these factors come into play then about how do we get the best out of staff and give them the mm -hmm. tools and knowledge necessary to make them as effective and as efficient as possible in terms of what mm -hmm. they're doing. So, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Nashaba. Um, Joshua, um, it's great to see you. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Could you possibly stick your question in the Q and A? Um, that would be really helpful. Uh, apologies, everyone. I, I, again, this is probably something we could talk about for the next hour quite comfortably. But another fantastic talk. So yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> 